makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here is what coming up on today's program. Italian banks claw back some of yesterday's losses as the government says the impact from its surprise tax will be limited. China slides into deflation as a property slump plunging export demand and subdued consumer spending weigh on the recovery. Plus, Amazon said to be in talks about becoming an anchor investor in the IPO of UK-based chip designer Arm. So good morning, everyone. We still have a packed show despite being a little bit thin on news for August, but we look at Nova Nordisk. We look, of course, at Treasuries. We look at CPI later tomorrow in the U.S. This is a picture across the board for some of the markets. You can see the FTSE gaining some 7 tenths of 8 percent. The CAC 40 gained 1.3 percent. The FTSE near in Milan, it's interesting because it's gaining 1.7 percent. So we'll have a full roundup of what's happening with the Italian banks. Uh, the finance minister really yesterday walked it out with a statement trying to put a little bit more meat on the boat about what this tax in terms of profits this year's for the banks really meant. Yesterday they freaked out bank stockholders. Uh, today they're appeased somewhat. A lot of the banks are gaining some three tenths of a percent. If you look at 10-year Treasury yield, now this is a big one because we heard from Patrick Harker also that uh, central bank, the central bank, the Fed could actually stop raising rates but then keep them at this level for a lot longer. So we see uh, the actually resilience of some of this 10-year also after we had a bond auction yesterday that was oversubscribed. You can see we're holding up above 4%. So let's, I was talking about the Italian banks, so let's have a look at what they're doing overall. I think they were gaining about 3% yesterday. A lot of them were actually slammed. Um, the two biggest ones you can see, Intesa San Paolo and Unicredit, that were down between 8 and 10% yesterday are now gaining 3 and 2%. So Italy has issued this clarification on its surprise bank profit windfall tax after lenders at some $10 billion wiped off of their value. Well, joining us now with more is Bloomberg's Alessandra Migliaccio. So, Alessandra, thank you uh, for joining us. I mean, it's incredible that they waited, actually, 24 hours for the clarification. But what's been said and what does it actually change? Right. So it is a bit crazy. I mean, we noticed that as well, obviously. Um, I think what happened is they they there was a surprise announcement initially from what we're told by sources. The finance ministry wasn't really planning on announcing this this soon. There was talk of some kind of tax on banks. But uh, Salvini, who's the deputy prime minister, really wanted uh, you know, a show right before vacation. He wanted to talk to his electorate. He wanted to do something for the people. You know, he's very much a populist element of Meloni's government. And then the next day, you know, the finance ministry had to pick up the pieces. They had to get their staff together. They had to decide how this 40% tax was going to work. And I think when they saw the bank route, they decided, yes, okay, let's do it. But let's, you know, put in um, certain things like uh, that it won't exceed 10% of the firm's assets and such to explain to you know the markets that it's going to be a tax, but it's not going to be quite as bad as initially uh, it seemed from Salvini's statements. Yeah, so Alessandra, what actually needs to happen next to, for this to become law? First of all, we had a similar situation in Spain where a lot of the banks are also taking legal action, and this has to be voted through Parliament. Yeah, so this is very interesting. I mean, it looks like, um, you know, all this is, a lot of this is we're basing on sources that we're speaking to, you know, both within the banks and the finance ministry, um, we do know that the, the law, it, it needs 60 days, then it goes through Parliament, as you said correctly, and then it could get changed. You know, there are a lot of lobbies, there are a lot of different opinions in Parliament. Um, also, you know, the banks could easily go to the courts, and because it's retroactive, there's a lot of things that are a little bit fishy about it, and they might not have to pay, or the money might be given back at some point. This has happened in the past. Um, but it's very much political, so, you know, we'll really have to see what happens. I think, in some ways, Meloni knew that she had to give Salvini something, and he's happy. You know, he got his result. He showed his electorate. He cares about them. Um, but then, you know, it leaves everybody else to pick up the pieces. Yeah, very well put. Alessandra, thank you as always. Alessandra Migliaccio, they're joining us from Italy now. Also joining us to discuss what's happening with the Italian banks and in general, the strengths or weakness of the European economy, PGM Chief European Economist Catherine Nice and Bloomberg's Justina Lee. So thank you both for joining us. Justina will look at the markets. And Catherine, you really look at some of the economics, underlying strength of weakness of some of these countries. I mean, this tax on banks really came as a surprise and we saw the immediate reaction of shock in the markets. W was this a mistake? Could it be of future things to come? So how do you see it as an economist? 
It's, it's not a great signal. I think so far the Maloney government has been seen as being very investor friendly. So this was a surprise uh, and, and not in a, in a good way. And I think it will raise question in investors' minds uh, if, if, if banks, what, what, what could be next? And of course we have to remember this is happening against a backdrop of weakening growth. We had uh, you know, a very uh, poor picture for economic activity in Italy in, in Q2 and it will just raise uh, some question marks uh, in investors' minds. Yeah, and, and there's also this question about the NPRR, the fact that you know that they haven't fully met the criteria to access the funds, of course, of the European Union. Do you worry about Italy right now? Yesterday, we, we were also looking at the spread between Italian you know, BTPs and German Bunds, but they didn't widen. Is there a danger that they do as we get into the winter months? I think that risk is, is going to be ever present so long as Italy has very high debt to GDP. Uh, you know, I have been very positive on Italy and on the periphery more generally for exactly these reasons that you mentioned. They now benefit from huge EU backstop measures that were not there uh, in the years before the pandemic. And that is really pretty much hardwired in for the years to come. That said, fundamentally, if Italy wants to get its debt to GDP ratios down sustainably, it needs to grow and that I think more attention is going to be focused on that in the coming months as we see the region slowing and so that could cause some of these risks to bubble up and crystallize. Um, Justina, does this have longer term market implications? I mean, we have some great story and great coverage on the Bloomberg terminal and we also had some really funny pieces. I mean, most Italians, I'm Italian, are at the beach in August and you know they had to recall basically bankers from the beach to deal with this sudden shock. Right, exactly. It really is pretty funny and a surprise, um, as just mentioned. And I think one interesting thing is, obviously, we always think of banking stocks as a cyclical kind of sector. But what cyclical means is that in the good years, you do expect to do better, as we have seen. But it's kind of funny that now the good years are not looking as good anyway. But I guess it changes the banking model. I mean, I was interested in what they said yesterday, which is, look, if you're passing on these higher interest rates to depositors, you're, you'll be pretty much fine. So this is a populist move also to, to make sure that the banks pass on some of their benefits. Yeah, that, I mean, that is true to some extent because we have seen net interest income at these banks rise as well. I think the longer term question for investors is if this risk is always present, I mean, does it mean generally lower valuations for banks going forward? And that could be something that could affect their cost of capital, which means ultimately it could kind of have this effect longer term. But I think it kind of depends on how the Italian government is now, you know, presenting this message to investors. Yeah. And Catherine, we're hearing, I mean, without speaking about the banks specifically, but we hear politicians, right, go after the banks because they're not paying depositors enough. And that, of course, would help with consumer spending. It kind of helps with, you know, what you're dealing with, with keeping the economy quite strong, even when interest rates rise. Are we going to see a, a change in consumer saving and spending as, as this shift happens? It will be one factor, I think, that will feed into consumer sentiment. Um, you know, as you said, this, this issue around interest rates is wider than Italy. We, we saw it here in the UK with the FCA uh, having meetings and, and making some moves in, in that direction. Uh, but it's just one factor. There are many things that are weighing on uh, consumer sentiment and plans uh, around spending. You know, clearly the cost of living crisis is, is a major one there. And I think as we see uh, some of these uh, price rises that we've been experiencing for more than a year now start to ease and come off energy and food, I think that is likely to be a more important factor behind consumer sentiment than some of these other things that you've discussed. Yeah, and we'll talk a bit more about consumer sentiment in Europe, but this is the big number. So th we started doing this this week, and actually thank you to Dan who puts it together. This is our big number of the day. It's $63 billion, and it's basically Novo Nordisk's gain yesterday in the market value, and this all has to do with one drug, Justina. Yeah, exactly. It's all about the weight loss drug Wegovy. Now, we've already heard a lot of hype about this drug, but what kind of the results yesterday showed was that it actually also reduced heart disease risk by, you know, around 20%. And even to analysts who kind of already knew about this drug, they said this is almost the best results you could have hoped for. Because what it means is that it really expands the market for this drug and also makes it more likely that maybe more insurers will reimburse, you know, the users for it.
Yeah, and so we have a big take on of Nordisk, and then we're excited we're speaking to the chief executive tomorrow as well. So we'll be back with Catherine Nice from PJ Bloomberg's Justina Lee. Both stay with us, and we'll talk a lot more, of course, about the European economy and uh, what uh, possible China deflationary impact can have on this region. Uh, the other story we're following is we were following some 17% in pre-market trading. This is on ongoing concern and doubt about the viability of the company. So we'll have plenty more on WeWork as well. Coming up, the world's second largest economy slides on deflation. We'll bring you the latest on the China inflation data and economic recovery. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, the conversations that matter, the insights you need, this is the Paul San Francisco Lacqua here in London. We're just getting the pre-market trading for WeWork, falling some 17% in pre-market trading. This is an ongoing concern about, well, and, and doubt about what happens to this company. So the company has raised serious concern that it could go out of business. I have to say yesterday, the stock already plummeted some 24% in extended trading on the news. Uh, this was one of the rowdy co-working startup that was transformed into a stable, profitable company. Or at least that's what they've been trying to do. And there are now real questions about it bleeding cash, customers of its office rentals canceling membership in, in droves. And so that's what WeWork said in a statement yesterday. And you can see it'll probably pan out in the next couple of days as we try and figure out uh, what happens. If you look at bonds, actually, at WeWork, they're also at deeply distressed levels. Now, China's consumer and producer prices both declined in July from a year ago, a sign of deflation pressure as demand in the world's second largest economy weakens. Joining us now for more on this is Jill Dices in Hong Kong. Jill, good morning or good afternoon, actually, for you. What are some of the key takeaways from this data? Yes, yeah, so I think the biggest takeaway here, um, looking past the factory gate prices, which have been in deflation for, I think, 10 months now, uh, that consumer price uh, the deflation was certainly very concerning. Um, so that was, uh, I think, the first time that we've seen that metric fall into deflation since early 2021. This is the first time since late 2020 that both of these metrics have been in deflation. Um, I think, you know, at this point, remember, uh, back in 2020, 2021, right when, um, you know, we were dealing with really the, the, the heart of the, the pandemic, um, and some price pressures there. Now, though, we're into 2023. We really thought that uh, China's, uh, we were expecting, you know, the consumption to drive the recovery for people to start spending money. And so what this is indicating is that even though a lot of that impact on that CPI gauge is coming from really volatile food and energy costs, if you look at the core CPI number, it's actually up uh, year on year. Uh, this still kind of indicates that, um, you know, there's a lot of issues with household consumer confidence in China, trying to convince people to spend money. And then it really sort of spells, I think, um, um, you know, uh, from economists, more of an urgency for the government to try to do more uh, to uh, boost uh, consumer spending, to get people to start spending money, to get ac mm. uh, economic activity going again through the rest of the year. So, Jill, this, this program has been a bit obsessed with Country Garden, but how much should we really worry about it? I mean, if there's a default, at the moment they have 30 days to pay the coupons um, that note holders yeah. haven't received on Monday. If it goes into default, what does it actually mean? Yeah, so I mean, so looking at Country Garden, I mean, you know, back to this whole issue of uh, China's economy in general, I mean, that has, you know, some looking at the, the property crisis, right? So Country Garden is China's sixth largest developer by sales. The idea that it's missing payments is certainly very concerning for uh, the company's liquidity, um, you know, possibilities for failure. I mean, this is all part of this ongoing years long story we've been telling about the property crisis in China. What does that actually mean? I think that the problem with Country Garden is that, again, because it's such a large developer, that means it has a lot of very active projects. And so, um, you know, you don't want to see a company of that size in China failing right now because, um, you know, that could have uh, ripple effects across the rest of the property market. Mm -hmm. uh, the government has been spending some time recently. I think some of its most robust policies uh, for economic support this year have been focused on the property sector, trying mm -hmm. to help, uh, you know, companies meet financing needs, that kind of thing. I think that, though, that this, uh, this country garden incident just spells, uh, you know, that it, the, the concerns about the property market are not ending in China. Um, we, we still yeah. have a lot to worry about before we see that kind of pick up. Jill, thanks so much. Jill Dice is there for us in Hong Kong. So we're back with PGM Chief European Economist Catherine Nice and our very own Justina Lee. Catherine, when you look at some of, I guess, the concerns in China, so are we importing deflation from China? 
I think the big concern for Europe is going to be that the, the weak inflation picture in China, as you've just discussed, is a reflection of weak demand. And weak demand in China means weak demand for European exports. And exports matter hugely for Europe, more so than for an economy like the US. And given that the economy in Europe is, is not strong at a domestic level, we can see that, that consumers are not firing on all cylinders. If external demand is weak as well, you know, what is there to hold up these economies? I think that is the question mark and the concern that Europe is going to sort of move back to a situation where it's basically flatlining when it comes to growth. And, and just, you know, what's the, your take on country garden, which I keep on mispronouncing? I mean, I keep on calling it garden country, which I'm, I'm not sure why it looks like a meme, um, you know, <laughs> at some point from like 2001 in the US. But what does it mean for the rest of the world? I feel like the market is very cool about what's going on, and yet they were freaking out about Evergrande. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, Bloomberg Intelligence analysts actually said today that a country garden default would be worse than Evergrande because they actually have four times more projects. And I think, you know, for now, uh, there is a bit of a kind of a grace period for it to pay back its bondholders. But I mean, the fact that it's even using that great grace period and maybe waiting for the liquidity to come, I think that's a very bad sign. But why is the market so cool about it, Justina? <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe it's already used to all the bad news from China. I mean, even today's kind of reaction to the deflation numbers, I mean, even that hasn't been too negative. I think the market is really waiting to see if the Chinese government will ease mon uh, kind of property measures further as they have promised to do. Yeah, so we haven't really seen, we don't think there's a direct link, all right, if there's a default of this company to Europe, but it would, I, I guess, kickstart some kind of mechanism, maybe with PBOC involved. And so that could change some of what happens in Europe, Catherine. So the indirect linkages between China and the rest of the global economy are far bigger than what the direct linkages would apply. The UK is a great example. We don't tend to trade very much directly with China, but if China is really going to slow, that's going to have a huge impact on the UK economy. Why? Because it matters, as we just discussed, for Europe, and Europe is the UK's largest trading partner. And so these indirect linkages are going to matter hugely. And even in terms of looking at financial market linkages what we know from the economy is in China is it tends to be you know less correlated with uh, other financial markets globally but when things move sharply you tend to see these correlations increase so I think there is always a risk that if we have you know big moves that that could then lead to some contagion effect. Yeah, there's always, we always underestimate maybe some of these linkages. Catherine, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Justina Lee. Catherine actually stays with us. She's from PGM where she's fixed income European economist. Uh, she stays with us and we'll talk a lot more also about the Fed linkage with Europe. But we'll do Fed and of course we'll do Bank of England next. This is Bloomberg. Inflation does remain too high. There's still a plausible story out there that inflation normalizes in short order and the economy dodges additional pain. There's a lot of talk over the last few weeks about the potential for what is often called a soft landing. Certainly last month's inflation read was a good one, and I hope it's a sign. Because to be sure, the Fed's objective is not to cause a recession, it's to reduce inflation in line with our mandate. That was the Richmond Fed President, Thomas Barkin, on the fight against inflation. Now, PGM Fixed Income's Chief European Economist, Catherine Nice, is still with us. Catherine, when you look at, you know, what's happening in the U.S., so there does seem to be a shift, and this could also be true from the ECB and, and the Bank of England, of, look, we're almost there on interest rate hikes, but then they'll stay here for longer. I mean, what does Fed policy, how do you, what does that mean for ECB? How much do they look at each other? Uh, I think the ECB is really setting rates for the euro area course, and yeah. Lagarde has emphasized that the macro situation in the euro area is quite different from the US. In the US the primary driver of the bout of inflation that they experienced was coming from very tight labor market, very strong economy whereas in the euro area it was primarily driven by these energy prices. So 
that that does mean sort of horses for courses when it comes to policy. That said, I think that general trend of being pretty much there when it comes to peak rate, with maybe some fine tuning around what that means, is is a common theme across both the ECB and the Fed, and they've both been very clear that they don't see you know a big series of uh, cuts anywhere on the horizon. Um, Catherine, what's your take on Bank of England? I mean, I feel like we're in a juncture. Right. I mean, we always say the BOE is in a juncture, but they could either, you know, mess it up or, or be okay with the economy. Like, what do they do next? So it looks to me like the Bank of England does have a bit more road to travel when it comes to higher interest right. rates. If you look at some of the near-term trends in underlying domestically generated yeah. inflation in the UK, it looks very concerning. You definitely do not have this clear and compelling picture that things are coming off like you do, for example, in the US. And that suggests that they do need to do more. Uh, you know, I think most people are expecting a couple more 25 basis point hikes. Um, but I think there is a risk. Uh, it's a long time between now and their next policy meeting. Yep. If the data surprise again to the upside on inflation and wages, then, you know, it could change. things could get, they could Catherine, get chased higher. Thank you so much. Catherine Nice. Italian banks claw back some of yesterday's losses as the government says the impact from its surprise tax will actually be limited. China slides into deflation, a property slump, plunging export demand and subdued consumer spending weigh on the recovery. Plus, Amazon is said to be in talks about becoming an anchor investor in the IPO of UK-based chip designer Arm. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. A lot going on, actually, for what is supposed to be a very quiet day on Wednesday in August. This is what we're looking at. First of all, the Italian government definitely backtracking what we heard just 24 hours earlier. They backtracked on part of this new windfall tax on banks, saying it would introduce a cap to limit the impact for many lenders as it really tries to calm a market route that wiped out 10 billion dollars from the bank's market value. Now, the levy we understand because the finance ministry put out a statement late yesterday, the levy will not exceed 0.1% of a firm's assets, and we also understand that banks that have already increased the interest rates offered to depositors will not have a significant impact as a consequence of the rule. So today, after losing about 10% each, maybe 8, 9% each yesterday in Tesa San Paolo, and you can tell Unicredit uh, gaining between 3 and 4 percent. Now, let's talk about a Bloomberg scoop. L'Occitane's controlling shareholder is said to be in advanced talks on a potential deal to take the skincare company private at a valuation of around $6.5 billion. Now, the move would add to a series of similar deals in Hong Kong as valuations remain depressed. Joining us from Hong Kong is our Bloomberg news reporter who always breaks news. He's Manuel Baigori. Manuel, it's been too long. Thank you so much for coming on. So why are we seeing this deal now and what's the rationale behind it? Hello, Francine. Uh, great pleasure to be on the show again. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, super interesting, right? And we're, we're seeing a slew of deals here in Hong Kong where valuations are really depressed. Uh, I mean, the Hansen index is, is performing pretty poorly compared to to, uh, to other global indexes. And, and that is leading to some take private transactions. Definitely a bright spot for M&A on a, on a very soft market for deal making globally. Uh, so here we go with uh, L'Occitane. Um, uh, global brand, very well known and uh, traded in Hong Kong, P ratio uh, very, very low. Uh, and and, and as, as we've seen with other transactions, the founder, the owner, majority owner of the company is, um, you know, taking this opportunity to potentially take the company private. Uh, he's lining up financing and, and, and about to launch an offer for the company. Uh, so, so we've seen this in the past yeah. several weeks with other transactions, and we're likely to see more of those. So, Emmanuel, would it make sense for some of the global firms listed in Hong Kong to be taken private and actually relist somewhere else? Definitely. I think that's the uh, rational Francine behind these deals. It's like the owner, uh, you know, takes control of the company, takes it private, uh, restructures the business a little bit, and, and then with the idea 
of relisting it somewhere else. We've seen some companies already thinking about that, potentially uh, you know, listing them, say, in mainland China or back in Europe. I think this could be an ideal candidate for, for such a move and potentially either selling it or releasing it at a higher multiple. And, and Manuel, is financing supportive of such deals? Well, we've seen financing uh, becoming a big issue, right? For the past uh, 12, uh, 18 months, uh, the financing markets have completely been shut. Uh, I think for strategic, uh, strategic transactions uh, where, where we see a founder uh, kind of like teaming up with some potential investors or just by himself taking control of the whole company. I think I think banks are still supportive of such transactions. Uh, here in Asia, perhaps it's a region where uh, bank financing is a little bit different and, and, and banks are a little bit more supportive and, and can finance some of these transactions. So so yeah, I think, I think uh, for transactions like this, uh, finance is still available, definitely. Manuel, thank you so much. Manuel Baigori there with the very latest on this great, wonderful scoop on L'Occitane. Now let's discuss this potential deal and what it says about the wider consumer and luxury market with Deborah Aitken from Bloomberg Intelligence. Deborah, you understand, I mean, you look at multiples and look at what this means, like day in, day out. You really are expert in terms of cosmetics and luxury and valuations. So L'Occitane stock is down some 20% in the last 12 months. What really plagued it? I think, and also since IPO, I was looking back since 2010 IPO, it's only up 50% pre all the rumors in the market of a potential uh, private uh, move by the, the chair and CEO. So the idea is that you know, it has, it's available in over 3,000 stores, but it has 1,300 stores standalone. And That's that is so expensive to run 1,300. And I was just in with the makeup ladies, and I said, you know, L'Occitan down on Cannon Street? No. no. So it just no. seems invisible no. in some areas. So it's about resonating with the younger consumer, doing more on social media, no. maybe getting some new life into the company. Um, and also, for it as a standalone, it's 20% of sales in the US, 20% in China. We know China has had too much inventory uh, mm -hmm. into travel retail and others across many of its competitors like, like Este and others. So there's a lot for it to do. So Deborah, do, do you think it's because fashion changes? I mean, I remember when it was really cool and everyone was talking about it, it was like this French you know, brand from Provence and people liked it. Or is it because there's a problem with the segment that it's, it's not really affordable? but it's also really high-end luxury, so it's kind of the squeezed middle. It is the squeezed middle, but if you get your messaging right, it can do very, very well. We've seen some very high-end deals coming through. Yeah. Um, it can do very, very well. It's just yeah. that I think the messaging isn't hitting and resonating. Yeah. The, the product is very good, organic, yeah. doing very, very well. It's, it's just the messaging to me. Um, so do you think it'll relist in Europe? Will it get acquired? I, th I would imagine, uh, well, both could be a possibility, you know, it runs an 80% gross margin, but when you get to the op line, the op margin is only 11%, that compares against 18% at Estee, 20 at L'Oreal, so there's a lot to do in terms of transition. In terms of relisting, we also have Coty in the, in the space seeking from US to also a dual list within Europe. And, and Coty is a perfumes, right? Yeah, they Coty, cool so perfumes. perfumes, more in skincare as well, makeup. Yeah. But, but acquiring in premium skincare too. So that's a plan there. And then also we can think about others across the luxury space. Prada looking also to do a list into Europe. Yeah. So potential there. So th there could be a bit of a trend. I have a million questions. I mean, this it may be inappropriate, but is it a little bit like the body shop at Occitan, or you just really think it's, it's a perception problem rather I, than an underlying bigger problem of, of where it is? No, I think it's both. Because so, I think L'Oreal had the same thing. It was very much niche in its own area, did very, very well for years. Yeah. Uh, sold on the organic ahead of its time, moved into the L'Oreal business, um, moved out. We then saw it being acquired again. And I kind of think that there's therefore lots of avenues for L'Occitane in the way that it could go. Um, its product is very, very good. Mm. It's just that it's doing something wrong between the growth and the op line, and that needs to be adapted. Um, Deborah, in terms of so the other story, which was quite exciting, I think like 10 days ago, so Caring, there are two big luxury companies, right? Caring LVMH. LVMH is doing so much better than Caring. Caring's cash cow is Gucci, and th they're struggling. And then they entered this deal with Valentino. Like, what does, is this a trend, or what does it tell us about the, the strength of the luxury sector? 
at the strength of luxury, the, the luxury sector overall, despite some of the negative headlines, I was looking at the half year, we're still seeing 12% growth at the half year, expecting double digit growth for the full year for the luxury sector. So yeah. overall, the strength is there, the profitability is yeah. holding out, and there are high end, more high end users coming into the marketplace. The aspirational side is where the squeeze is. And if your yeah. product is not quite right or is seen as fashion linked, there's been a little bit of softness there. And that's the issue with Gucci for almost two years now. It's struggle versus its peer group. To give you a couple of numbers, we had 24% growth at the half one from MMS, 17% from LVMH group across the board, and 2% from uh, Kering. Within that, only 1% growth from Gucci. So it's doing a lot. It's reorganizing its board. Um, a new board member coming in, ex-Chanel, Okay. Um, CEO, uh, uh, sorry, CFO, and also the head of Yves Saint Laurent taking new dual CEO roles. And then also we have um, the creative director out, temporary Palus taking over the CEO role yeah. at the moment of Gucci, and then so they'll be looking to do lots more. And then also what's really interesting for the Gucci side under Karen, yeah. the new creative director coming in, who, who is in, and where we'll see more of his product, uh, DeSanto. He was actually 13 years of Valentino. So yeah, what does that say when they're bringing the brands it's a small together? small world. There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's yes. a lot going on. Yes. And then Kering also going after you know, the, the talent agency. We'll have to get you back on to talk about that, because I don't know whether this is world dominance from, from the luxury companies. Our Deborah Aitken there from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, M&A bankers, thank you, Deborah. M&A bankers um, are set to see their bonuses tumble this year as the business remains stagnant. According to consultancy firm Johnson Associates, merger advisors could see payouts slump as much as 25 percent and any respite is unlikely until next year. Well, here with more is Bloomberg's finance managing editor. He's Tom Metcalf. Um, Tom, always great. I mean, we get you on every day because there's something going on with the banks. Always something going they're, on. They're either doing better or much worse than expected. I mean, what does this bonus actually tell us about the strength of, of this, in, you know, of this part of the industry? Yeah, I think there's no great surprises in the report. As you say, deal makers, their bonuses this year is not going to be great. I think also you go, it's going to go through the structure, even fixed incomes. There might be a bit of disappointment there, though within that there'll be some real outperformers. I think if you're looking for the bright lights, it's actually the wealth side of things that they're saying, hey, this is going to do quite well this year. Uh, and I think you know, the, the reason the bonus um, stories are interesting is, is what it says about the industry. And this really reinforces, you know, if you're an M&A, you're having a rough time. Uh, but there are other sort of brighter spots in finance right now. I, I mean, I love having you on talk about this because we always get bankers and saying, well, I don't feel too sorry for them because they made so much money yeah. in the last couple of years. We, it, how long will this continue? Are we seeing any green shoots I mean, or is everyone going to work for a hedge fund? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, on the deal making side, you know, there'll be a bit of a lag as well when, before the deals come through. So, look, it's clearly a, for whole, this whole year is basically a write off. Uh, 2024, it just depends what happens. You know, do some big deals move through? Um, and of course, yes, everyone you know, looks towards the hedge funds as maybe the, the saviour for the big paydays, but everyone's looking at that space. It's a, still a relatively small industry when yeah. you compare it to, to banking, so there's not that many other options out there. And, and then there was a story saying they're all moving to Dubai, so we'll have to get back on. That's the other move. move to the Dubai. Hedge fund. There you go. Become a hedge fund and move to Dubai. You did not hear this on the pulse. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. Bloomberg's managing editor for finance, Tom Metcalf. Coming up, can Europe's second most valuable company continue its momentum? Today's big take is on the pharma giant, Nova Nordisk. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, it was talked about at the Oscars. Elon Musk is said to love it, and there's even a song dedicated to it. The weight loss drugs Ozempic and Wagovi have propelled Nova Nordisk to become Europe's second most valuable company. Now, after a record gain yesterday, trading of Nova Nordisk this morning is seeing some pressure. The firm's struggle to meet demand are also raising questions. So can it hold onto the momentum and leave up to the hype? Well, those are the questions we're exploring on today's Big Take. Let's go straight to Naomi Kresge, who covers European pharmaceuticals for us. So, Naomi, I mean, this is a huge story. If you look at how much it gained in market share yesterday, it's our big number of today, it's some 68 billion. What's Nova Nordisk's challenge now that the select trial has come back so positive? 
Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, the challenge really becomes one of execution, right? Yesterday's trial results were a home run, really. And now the question is, how do they move forward from that and make sure that they can produce enough of these medicines to meet the demand, demand that almost certainly will increase after the trial results? So what's unique, Anomi, about this company? So it, in so many ways, it's just so Danish. Um, it has a, uh, a foundation as an anchor shareholder. There's just a tremendous amount of stability because of this. Um, also, when it comes to corporate culture, um, there's a culture of you know, being able to have work-life balance, um, flex time, um, a lot of employees um, just taking July off um, in Copenhagen at the headquarters. Um, and so this, this, I think, is really, really quite unique. So are there potential downside risks right now? What are investors expecting from Novo? I think it, it does really become um, a story about whether they will be able to meet demand for these medicines, whether they will be able to really capitalize on the first mover advantage. Um, they're the only ones right now that have a weight loss shot with this level of proven effectiveness, this you know, heart benefit that's now been shown. Um, and they you know, are really in a space of needing to roll it out in more countries and make sure that they can meet the demand that does exist. Naomi, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Naomi Kresge there with the very latest on Novo Nordisk. And you can read today's Big Take in full. Just check out NI Big Take. Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Now, we'll also be speaking to the Novo Nordisk Chief Executive Officer tomorrow. I'm excited about that interview. Lars Furregaard, and that's tomorrow at 9 a.m. UK time right here on Bloomberg. We also look at WeWork shares. They've continued to plunge in pre-market trade. This is after the company said there's, quote, substantial doubt about its ability to continue operating. Now, the co-working business cited sustained losses and canceled memberships to its office spaces. WeWork says it will spend the next 12 months reducing rental costs, negotiating more favorable leases, and increasing revenue. Also, Wells Fargo and BNP Paribas are among firms that will pay hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties for employees using WhatsApp and other unofficial tools to conduct business. It's the latest crackdown by U.S. regulators on Wall Street's failure to keep records of communication. Now, total fines over messaging violations have now topped two and a half billion dollars. Coming up, SoftBank Group's arm is said to be in talks with some U.S. big tech as investors expect an IPO next month. So we'll bring you more on that Bloomberg scoop next. And this is Bloomberg. the insights you need. This is a Pulse and I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the Fed says it's stepping up scrutiny of lenders' involvement in digital assets, the latest move by the U.S. regulators to limit banks' involvement in crypto. The U.S. Central Bank says they will focus on banks' partnerships with firms that are not lenders, such as fintech companies, to provide services to customers. Now, over the past year, the Central Bank and other regulators have repeatedly warned lenders to be wary of risks associated with the asset class. Also, Galaxy Digital founder and chief executive Executive Officer Mike Novogratz has commented on the U.S. approach to regulating crypto assets. The approach from the SEC to regulate through enforcement and to really thwart our industry, which feels like it's come from Elizabeth Warren and Sherrod Brown and maybe Lael Brainerd and a few people, uh, we called it choke point 2.0 operation, uh, seems obvious and is just un-American. Well, Amazon is said to be in talks about joining other tech companies and as an anchor investor in the IPO of chip designer Arm. The listing of the UK-based firm is expected to raise as much as $10 billion. Now, a source says Amazon is one of about tech 10 
tech companies in talks with Intel, Alphabet and Nvidia, also amongst potential investors. Now the SoftBank backed company could list as soon as early next month. So let's go straight to Bloomberg's Mark Bergen, who covers the MEA of startups and VCs for us. Mark, I mean, this is an amazing story, right? First of all, why would Amazon want to invest in ARM? It's probably a little bit of uh, FOMO, the fear of missing <laughs> out here. This is set to be the biggest tech IPO since Alibaba and Facebook, now, now Meta. Um, you know, Amazon has also made a big strategic investment with ARM so far as just a commercial relationship. ARM is, they, ch they chose ARM as sort of the chip designer for their data centers. Uh, which was an unusual choice and, and one that's probably paid off pretty well. AWS is like leading that market. I think there's roughly 40,000 we reported cust AWS customers that are already using ARM technology. ARM is trying to move right now. It's, its technology is primarily used in smartphones, tablets, computers. It's trying to move up to data centers. Uh, it seems like that's a strategic partnership here where a AWS is saying that hey, we're going to get in on this technology, not just a commercial relationship, but, but as an investor. Uh, and for ARM, it's clearly a, a, a critical and important customer. So, Mark, how does this fit into ARM's business strategy? Yeah, so I think that's my, my understanding is that this is really critical for them. They, ARM and, and SoftBank, the, the owner, are making this big bet that this wave we've had in, in generative AI and artificial intelligence is just going to continue, going right. to keep going up. Yep. Uh, the big demand for artificial intelligence is on computing power, uh -huh. uh, mostly from the tools that NVIDIA sells, and, and data centers. Like, it needs a lot of computing resources here. So if, if ARM can, in fact, kind of pivot to becoming an integral part of data centers, uh, that is a, a big market for, uh, opportunity for them. So Mark, is, is this why all the big tech, I mean, 10 big tech companies is, is a lot. Is that why they're all so interested in this IPO? Yeah, I think so. We have, we've reported that NVIDIA and Intel are also in. You know, the chip market is, is really hot right now yeah. after kind of being cool for such a long, a long time. Uh, this is... Uh, ARM is this sort of critical part of it's like the blueprint for this technology. Um, you know, SoftBank has had previously tried to, to combine and merge this with NVIDIA, which didn't work. This is the big take. I think there's also, you know, there's a lot of hope and optimism that, that it both revitalizes some of the IPO market, which is in, in tech has certainly been very cold, uh, and then proves that this AI hype here is, is here to last. Okay, brilliant reporting, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark Bergen. There, looking at uh, this potential IPO of ARM. Now, the other story that we talked about yesterday and again today is Italian banks. So the Italian government seems to have backtracked on part of its new windfall tax on banks, saying it would introduce um, a cap to limit the impact for many lenders as it tries to calm a market route that wiped out some $10 billion from the bank's market value. Now, the levy, we understand, will not exceed 0.1% of the firm's assets and banks that have already increased the interest trade offered to depositors will not have a significant impact as a consequence of the rule. So yesterday they were down some 8, 9%. Today you can see Intesa San Paolo getting some 3.2%, Unicredit getting 4.3%. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, the Credit Gupta in New York, our Danny Berger here in London, and this is Bloomberg.